Jackson and Sheridan, The Valley Campaigns, the third volume in the Blue and Grey Campaign series by Worthington Games, the third that I played also after Grant's Gamble and Lee's Invincibles. This is a game that depicts the two campaigns that took place in and around the Shenandoah Valley in 1862 and 1864, respectively, with Jackson being the superstar of the first and Sheridan the superstar of the second. The three games, so Grant's Gamble, Liz Invincibles, and Jackson and Sheridan, uh, rely uh, on the same system. They have the same core system and just very few extra unique rules for each game. Uh, in the first video about the system, uh, in my video for Grant's Gamble, I talked about the system in detail. At the beginning of the um, video for Liz Invincible, I gave you a shorter version. Now I'm going to try to give you the mega super short version. Let's see if I can make it like in a minute or less. And the uh, core system, you use these wooden blocks that represent military units. This is the number of combat points. This is their morale. This is the number of dice that they roll in combat. When they lose points, you simply turn them. When they restore points, you turn them the other way around. Usually they are facing the owning player, so you only see where the opponent's blocks are, but not exactly what they are. You reveal the blocks when you're in combat. And you also have leaders that have special magic abilities and the cavalry that is used to screen and prevent movements of the opponent. Each turn you receive command points that you use to move your units. You activate as many units as you have command points. You move them in all in all locations where you will have units of both sides at the end of movement, you resolve combat. Combat, you roll a bucket of dice, you roll the number of dice indicated by uh, on the blocks of all of your units. Each six is a hit, each hit also forces the opponent to take a a morale test, uh, the units of the opponent may be forced to retreat uh, because they failed the morale. A battle will end when only one side has blocks in an area because the other side has been completely annihilated or one of the two sides has retreated. Maybe a voluntary retreat or maybe a mandatory retreat. It is mandatory if all of the remaining units of the losing side uh, have failed their morale test. You take fire when you retreat, but the damage you receive is much lower if you are retreating voluntarily than if you are retreating a mandatory retreat. Okay, that took a little longer than a minute, pretty much two, but not too bad. Now, about the unique features of this game. Let's look at the map. This dotted line here is very important. It represents the border of the valley. All locations on this side of the line are in the valley. All locations are out of the valley. And there are sort of rules, not many actually, about uh, the effects that uh, that occur when units are in the valley or out of the valley. This line here represents uh, an important uh, um, objective for the Union player that is trying to move units south of this valley to threaten the Confederacy. And this line here similarly represents an important objective for the Confederate player who is trying to place units north of that line to threaten the Union so to achieve a political to to create a political impact not just achieve a military victory point to point map uh, Then you simply move from area to area each location that you see on the map is a single game space now uh, this game pretty much is two games, so the scenarios are very different from one another. In the first scenario, the 1862, which is by far my favorite scenario of the two, um, it represents the challenges that uh, Jackson had to face when he had to deal with three large and scary Union armies. And just like you have in the situation, Jackson will need to run around, punch, retreat, run around, punch, and constantly keep the three Union armies of balance. If they gather, if they start acting in a coordinated way, then it's the end for the Confederate player. Luckily enough, the difficulty for the Union to coordinate the three armies is mirrored by a small, low number of command points that the Union player has. So you had these massive armies, but rarely are you able to use them all three in a single turn. 
and uh, in this game also uh, the Jackson block, the uh, piece representing Stonewall Jackson, has a special ability. He can move up to two Confederate units that are stack with him uh, up to four locations instead of the usual um, the usual movement allowance of infantry units very important feels very historical represents the ability of jackson to disappear from one side of the valley and you appear on another side very useful to run away very useful again to punch the the opponent and and to inflict damage that way but the space for the fight is not big, so Jackson is playing a dangerous game of cat and mouse with the Union player. If the Union player manages to trap Jackson, then that is pretty bad in general terms and also simply in victory terms because one of the victory conditions for the Union player is to capture Jackson. Other than that, victory is assessed on victory points, which are mainly gained by control of specific areas on the board. And just to give you a better sense of how things look at the beginning of the game, this is the uh, set of instruction. These are the set of instruction for the scenarios. As you can see, there are these blocks here, which represent uh, armies that are not very big, that start here, kind of on the defensive. Garrisons and cavalry, you know, they can be useful, but only to an extent. And then you have these monster, these monster armies here belonging to the Union player. A 12 point army, 12 point army, another 12 point army that are located here, here, and here. So tough job, but but doable. The net of connections to the board makes uh, makes it definitely uh, possible for the Union for the for the Confederate player to replicate the success that Stonewall Jackson had back then. The game really does a good job of portraying the disparity in terms of command, with Jackson running around like crazy and the Union player struggling to keep up with that and to coordinate massive attacks. We also have a second scenario, as I said, pretty much is a second game, played on the same map. Uh, Sheridan, 1864, representing this other campaign. This time, Sheridan, the Union player, is a behemoth. You have this monster army that is simply marching down and, and trying to destroy everything that they find on the way. Early is in control of a decent... Uh, decently sized um, group of forces which of course would be more effective if the other group wasn't so uh, disproportionately stronger so here for the confederate players a matter of delaying it's a matter of figuring out when to trade time for space and vice versa breaking down into small groups denying control of key locations and again um, victory points and the scenario assigned based on control of locations on the map as the confederate player you want to keep the union as not as possible as the union player you want to move down south as far as possible uh, in this game both sides have leaders. In the previous game, only only the Confederate player has a leader with a specific ability. So here you have Early and Sheridan, and they both have a limited extra movement ability. That is, they both can move with a single block of their side up to four spaces. And in a certain sense, is a minor is a is a minor version of the power that Jackson has. Uh, still an interesting and challenging game, just not as, as original as the as the 1862 campaign is, because it's more of a of a obvious, a straightforward dichotomy: defender versus attacker, um, in a fairly straightforward way. Uh, in the previous scenario, also you know who the attacker is and who is defender. Well, kinda, because Jackson has to be on the attack, but also the uh, opponents are not simply sitting there and waiting just to defend. They also need to move around and try to capture Jackson and try to block Jackson from going around doing too much damage. So the previous one, the 1862, has a less obvious dichotomy, defender-attacker. You still have the sense that Jackson is a defender, but the 1862 just has a much more varied and interesting use of space than the game about the 1864 campaign has. I'm really growing fond of the system. I enjoyed all three games in the system, and I definitely enjoyed this implementation here. may just be my favorite one. Two games, uh, to me, of an equal quality and interest. Uh, the 62 game definitely is the superstar here, and by itself is worth the price of a mission.
And the 64 game, there's really nothing wrong with it. It's a perfectly mm, playable and enjoyable entry-level war game. It is just, I guess, that the 62 game shines so much then the other game feels a little underwhelming by comparison. But per se, there's nothing wrong with it at all. But the 62 game, the 62 game is really something <clears throat> something special. I hadn't played a game about that campaign in a while. I think the last one that I played was another blog game by Columbia Game games um, and that game was enjoyable but this one this one I think is even better because it does something similar than the, <clears throat> the Shenanda campaign uh, does the one by Columbia but it does it in a more um, elegant way with less pieces on the board and just more of a sense of of fluid action more of a sense of interactivity you had this constant game of cat and mouse between Jackson that runs around like a madman um, trying to do so many things and keeping everybody else off balance and these bulky Union armies that always seem to be on the verge of crashing the opponent and yet if the opponent is a skill player hmm, then uh, they, they, they're they bound to be there on the verge of victory for a very long time. I'm just two turns away from winning and then somehow victory seems to be receding as the game progresses. Yes, it is tough to play as Jackson as it should be, so if you have players of unequal experience, probably you want to give the uh, Jackson the Jackson uh, side to the to the most skilled player, but then still um, the situation is such that then of course um, a skilled player can definitely <clears throat> make up for it. It is just that making a mistake as the Union is like punishing because yeah you may lose a couple of steps in a battle, but making a mistake as Jackson and as the Confederates in this game is much more uh, of a of, a, of, a, of an end game situation because if you get captured then the game is over immediately. But definitely an interesting challenge with pieces that have to stay in the valley to be fully functional to gain to, to, to um, receive all the benefits that the game system gives them and also not to give victory points to the opponent if you only start leaving the valley then it's bad for that side. But then you can take advantage of small uh, periods outside of the valley, maybe you even decide to invest a little bit in there, in that, uh, giving victory points to the opponent by deploying some units uh, eccentrically outside of the valley, but then you return at a surprise point. Uh, it seems like it's a small map, given then only half of the map really is the center of the action. But the other side, if nothing else, for the, for the possibilities that it offers, the other side of the valley, that side of the map is still important. Even if no one ever gets there, the fact that you have to factor in the possibility that they may decide to bravely leave the valley and try to uh, run around you, that is still a possibility that is factored into the strategy, it becomes part of the experience. It's a very tense, very exciting game. There is a reason why the historical campaign of 1862 is one of the most interesting uh, military campaigns probably in, in military history one of the ones that people have been studying uh, thinking about commenting on and it just works well in game design if it is captured in an interesting system because it's also entirely possible uh, to, to depict it in a way where the Union Army is simply um, have too easy a time getting together and then it becomes both non-historical and completely an interesting situation. The game here really managed to create that tension of one side having mobility and superior command, the other side having size and strength but being, being behind when it comes to mobility and coordination. Uh, it's a completely unequal contest, the two sides play in very different ways, so you have replay value there, by playing one side rather than the other you will be facing completely different sets of challenging challenges. Uh, x on the 1962 game, because again, to me this is really what matters here, I almost think of this as, this is, the game is called Jackson, and you have a bonus game, which is the Sheridan game. The Jackson game really is very, very good, and this in general is a good package, even if you think of Sheridan as the bonus game, you do have a bonus game. But even if just for the 62 game only, this is definitely a worthy purchase. I'm very happy with the system in general, I'm having ha very happy with... Uh, uh, the implementations of the system and I hope to see more titles in the future because with this uh, blue and gray campaign system we have games that are very playable, simple to play, 
um, very mm, linear in terms of the mechanics, but that offer depth, that offer uh, a quick pace, that offer all sorts of challenges. And in all three cases, the system, which is very smart, if so lean, in all three cases, the game, the system has been implemented well in games that I found very enjoyable. This is me, Mark Arnaldo, reporting on Jackson and Sheridan, the Valley Campaigns by Worthington Games. Excellent game, works well for uh, casual way gamers, for newer gamers, for beginner gamers, but definitely there is enough fun to be had here uh, with the games and the system, even for experienced way gamers.